worked on numerous national and radio programs, local radio programs in US, Canada, and Australia, as well as on a member of television programs such as Talk Back Live, Spike's Thou Thousand Ways to Die, Sci-Fi's The Joe Rogan Experience, and the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum. Let us give him a warm welcome, DJ Grotti. I appreciate that introduction, warm introduction. I could not have written it better myself. <laughs> it's really a pleasure for me to be at this event uh, hosted by the Institute for Science and Human Values because this organization is the organization that has Paul Kurtz's DNA. And I've spent many years uh, under uh, working uh, uh, with Paul Kurtz, I almost said under, but he was so democratic at times that it really didn't feel hierarchical like that. Great conversations, debates about corporate strategy. Uh, that's the sort of leadership the humanist movement uh, thrives on. So thank you, Tony, for the invitation. When she invited me to be on the board earlier last year, I was happy to do so, and I'm happy to serve along with the other uh, board members uh, this important organization. Uh, before I uh, get into our exploration of uh, radical life extension as an approach for secular people to think about uh, death and dying in a godless way, um, let, let's just hear it for Tony Van Pelt, Bob Tapp, uh, the people who have put on this conference because, because being at this racket for 18 years now, so I'm a, I'm a young pup compared to, uh, I mean, Bob Tapp t told me yesterday he's about to turn 90 years old. Talk about radical life extension, right? Um, but in my, in my 18 years, uh, I can't think of a single other conference put on by the communities of reason, by humanists, devoted to this important topic. And I think this deserves much wider recognition, much more attention by the organized humanist movement. So as secular humanists, we obviously lack the hope of an afterlife that most religious people have. And we learned last night from uh, Bob and, and a lot of philosophers of religion uh, uh, compar comparative religionists will argue that the fear of death is one of the uh, motivators in religious belief. So if believers are believers because of fear of death, does this mean that atheists and humanists and skeptics somehow just don't fear death enough in order to believe in God? I don't think that's the answer. Uh, I think it's just that we've looked for the evidence of God and have found it lacking. But as we explore this weekend uh, throughout our diversity of viewpoints about secular approaches to death and dying, um, I want to bring to the table the idea of an approach to death that actually constitutes rejecting it, trying to reject it, push back against it uh, in Dylan Thomas's uh, words, to rage, rage against the dying of the light. And before you think that seems uh, sort of wackaloo or on the fringe or cont too controversial or impossible, consider for a moment, as Saroja was touching on, that the human species has a pretty successful track record already of raging against the dying of the light, against fighting death. Uh, Saroja um, sort of addressed it in general terms, but just in the last couple hundred years of human life on the planet, there have been amazing, really impressive victories against infectious diseases, parasitic diseases. Just in the last couple decades, in fact, new discoveries, uh, the vaccines against hepatitis B, uh, more people die from that disease than malaria, for instance, a year, uh, a new vaccine against uh, hepatitis A, um, a vaccine for Lyme disease, even a Duengue fever vaccine. So there are 
uh, ways medical science ameliorates human suffering, even fights against death. Bill Gates and others are even working on a malaria vaccine. So death has been staved off dramatically uh, through these medical advancements. Also, simple things like better nutrition, uh, better sanitation, advances in the medical sciences. There's been a pretty dramatic and steady increase in human life expectancy as a result. I indeed, just over the last 150 years of human life on the planet, our life expectancy has uh, doubled. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that there's been an average lengthening of life every year since 1840 of about three months. And if you look at this exponentially, you could start getting a little um, zealous uh, about uh, life extension. And so we'll explore some of those claims critically, skeptically, but also with an eye toward the humanist project in this talk. As I mentioned, uh, in the last 150 years, life expectancy has almost doubled. This is a graph uh, that shows uh, just uh, in the last 100 or so years, in America, it's gone from 50 uh, years to about uh, 80 years old today. The same sort of extension of life has been seen around the world. Think of it this way. Uh, so when I was in Bible college, I read this book, How to Lie with Statistics. So I'm very cautious about uh, zhuzhing the numbers to make it sound better than it is. But stick with me here, because the, uh, when you look at the statistics, I think you'll be as impressed as I am. Over the course of human history, the odds of living from birth to 100 has risen from 1 in 20 million, the stati statisticians say, to just... One in 50 today, especially if you're a woman in a Western state, in a high life expectancy state, Japan, Northern Europe. Uh, there, the growth rate um, among the, the oldest of the old, those 80 years old and older, and I'm looking at my friend Bob Tapp, um, that's the, now the fastest growing segment of the population. Not kids, not middle-agers, but the oldest of the old. I'm a little chagrined and shy to call someone old. I thought it was rude, but having turned 40, I feel <laughs> finally I have the right to do so. The growth rate of the oldest of the old is twice that of those 65 and older, and almost four times that of the total population. In the United States, this group, people over 80 years old, now represents 10% of the older population and will more than triple in the next couple decades. Over the next 20 years, the number of people in the, in the West living past 100 is actually expected to increase tenfold. So we're looking at an, a, a, a population around the world that's growing older, but not in a way that's uh, decrepit or uh, near death, but active and vibrant and with mobility and enthusiasm. Indeed, uh, when I think about this growing population, I think about folks like Bob Tapp and Paul Kurtz. Paul Kurtz, who uh, in his 80s always had more energy than I did, would call before anybody woke up, would stay up later than everybody. Uh, maybe that's just genetic, maybe it's his philosophy of life, and we'll get into that. So, the point is, people are living longer. We've already begun succeeding at raging against the dying of the light. But as a result, death has become largely something, uh, if you're looking at populations, that only the, the very, very old do. Increasingly, people don't die if you're not old. Uh, if everyone's living a lot longer, who's doing the dying? Uh, essentially, dying with or without deity has become something that, by and large, most people only do when they uh, are very old, accepting things like accidents and, and uh, other causes of death that we'll get into. Another way of thinking about that is just that old people have the highest mortality rate. That s sounds sort of obvious, but it's a part, a, a really foundational part of this argument about radical life extension. B 
because radical life extension essentially has to do not with making people just live longer, but with combating a class of diseases called the diseases of aging. When old people die, what are they dying from? They're dying from the diseases of aging. We often say she died of natural causes, but what we mean is she died of a class of diseases called the diseases of aging. These are things like uh, cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's, cancer, type 2 diabetes. Uh, these are diseases that you don't get when you're 10 years old by and large or 30 or even uh, necessarily 50, although that's when the diseases of, uh, diseases of age, uh, aging uh, start appearing in that population. If you look at the top 10 causes of death for people in the US as an example, and these are last year's numbers according to the C CDC. Heart disease, cancer, these are in order. Cro uh, COPD, stroke, accidents, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, influenza, and especially pneumonia, kidney disease, and suicide. All of them, except for two, are considered diseases of aging. I mentioned that obviously there are the relatively rare exceptions of someone young getting cancer. Uh, if it happens in our family, it doesn't feel rare, but that's uh, a sampling error. You look at larger populations, it's the older people who get the diseases of aging. And the interesting thing about this class of diseases is that it is inevitable that every one of us will get one of them if we don't get the others. So just genetically, if we don't get cancer and we live long enough, we will get Alzheimer's. Or if we don't get Alzheimer's but we live long enough, our hearts will uh, wear out. Uh, so we're all living much longer, generally only dying when we're very old. And guess what? A doubling of life expectancy in just the last 150 years is not enough for us, and I say, it shouldn't be. We want much more. It's a quest, it's a passion, it's a big business. And uh, I wanna talk about some problems and perils in that regard. Quick poll, how many people in this room regularly exercise? Just raise your hand. Uh, so, since the camera is not on the audience, uh, that was almost everyone except for me and Roy Speckert. We did not raise our hands. Yeah. Although, I think I may have to start exercising because my partner joined a gym and for the first time in a decade, and we've joined gyms every year or two and never gone, he's taken it very seriously and gotten a trainer and I'm feeling the pressure. In fact, I was told recently to skip the dessert and I realized our relationship had finally changed. <laughs> By show of hands, how many of you take vitamins every day or supplements? Honest to goodness, that is almost everyone too. A couple younger people aren't doing it, but everyone else. How many of us watch what we eat? We avoid certain kinds of foods to avoid certain kinds of diseases that we're told by our doctors those foods could result in, say red meat or uh, we have, how many of us make other lifestyle choices uh, to extend our life? So not smoking, uh, something like that. Okay, so the, the point is all of us are already engaged in life extension without really thinking about it in those terms. The reason, really I'd say the only reason uh, we try and do all of these things, exercise, try to eat right, is uh, to extend our lives, to maximize our well-beings. Uh, a lot of people are pushing this sort of stuff. I mentioned it's big business, but there's a problem because some of the people pushing this stuff aren't so reputable. Uh, here's everyone's favorite doctor. I think Oprah considers him America's doctor, Dr. Oz. Um, and uh, uh, enough skeptics in, in the audience here to realize that not everything he's selling do you want to buy. There's a whole industry of uh, uh, 
supplements and pills and not just vitamins, but um, herbal remedies, all sorts of things that make big promises of radically extending your life. So the question is, is all this buzz about life extension just bunk? Are all of these people saying, you can live longer if you just do X, Y, and Z? Are they all just con artists trying to snooker the gullible, take advantage of the secular society's fear of death, just like previously maybe we think religionists uh, would take advantage of those who had a fear of death. Well, there are some big players getting into this business, not just the hucksters and the uh, pseudoscientific quacks. Big players now are pushing life extension more than ever. Look at just some of the headlines in, in the last seven, eight days, and then there's one from a couple months ago. Um, Tech Titan believes that people should live forever. That's Peter Thiel, uh, who is co-founder of PayPal. Now, uh, the headline is a little overstated because none of these people pushing radical life extension uh, believe in immortality in this quasi-religious or supernatural sense, but they believe in what I'll talk about in a minute when I get to Ray Kurzweil, living long enough to live forever uh, is a line that he uses. Live forever. Scientists say they'll soon extend life well beyond 120. Can your body be hacked to achieve radical longevity? Google reportedly investing hundreds of millions of dollars into a new life extension company, Calico. And uh, this is a Time Magazine article where uh, they interview CEO uh, of Google, Larry Page, about uh, his investments in radical life extension. Saroja mentioned uh, um, Peter Diamantis of the X Prize, Craig Venter, uh, Larry Ellison, the founder of uh, Oracle. Indeed, so many tech leaders are all in this, uh, uh, I think, uh, ultimately a sort of humanist project, but it, it's considered, and I'll explain why a minute, in a minute, uh, uh, to be largely under the rubric of something called transhumanism, as if it somehow is beyond the human. I'll argue uh, why I don't buy that in, in a minute. NASA, Google, uh, Nokia, a uh, number of uh, bodies have come together to found something called the Singularity University, which applies new technologies to projects, uh, big uh, problems like uh, curing aging, or in some formulations, uh, solving the death problem. And we uh, can't really get into the, uh, uh, the technophilia side of this without talking about Ray Kurzweil. This is the um, sort of supernaturally brilliant inventor who invented the first flatbed scanner, uh, the first speech synthesizer, text-to-speech synthesizer, he invented the first uh, music synthesizer uh, that was uh, widely used by many musicians we, we know, like Stevie Wonder, Anne Murray, uh, the band Chicago, Bruce Springsteen, Vangelis, Paul Schaefer from The Tonight Show. So he's, he's one of these people who's had big impacts in many different fields, and he spent the last 20 years or so of his life focusing on new technologies to ameliorate uh, human suffering or solve big human problems such as death. The point is, yes, he's a genius inventor, but uh, he's also a sort of futurist whose big idea is the law of accelerated returns, uh, something he calls the law of accelerated returns, where he looks at the evolution or maybe revolutions in technology and plots and exponential growth. So not just in the price performance uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, pr processors and computers and how they're getting smaller and smaller. It's not like in 10 years my iPhone will be this small. Uh, but uh, a whole host of technologies in not just in computing but in um, the biomedical sciences, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, 
really a whole host of applying future technologies uh, to current uh, problems. He was recently hired by Google as their head of engineering and his big job there is to work on developing with the resources behind, behind Google, uh, really pushing toward developing strong AI, uh, computer intelligence on par with human intelligence. And this is part of his larger argument uh, about the singularity, that artificial intelligence will be part of impending rapid technological changes in, te uh, in, uh, uh, in the sciences, uh, uh, especially in technology, that among other things leads to, in effect, human immortality. The singularity is a metaphor from physics. The, the uh, uh, astrophysical singularity is the black hole, this uh, event in space, time, that once you go through, uh, you're beyond the laws of, of physics and, and th there's really no looking back. It, it is such a marked change from going through the black hole to being uh, before the black hole. And he says, uh, he argues that there is a technological singularity uh, impending in the next 25, 30 years, he predicts, where technology will so radically have accelerated that the world we're living in right now will be unrecognizable. And if you just look at the last three years, say, of technological growth, or the last 10, you realize how dramatically things have changed already for us, so it's easy to uh, find seductive some of these sorts of claims. You know, just three years ago, three years ago, uh, social networking and online communication systems weren't what they are now. 10 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. So uh, uh, you, you see the uh, implementation and radical impacts of these technologies. It should be said that he is all in when it comes to radical life extension, and he's one of these folks who takes hundreds of supplements a day, and uh, from a skeptical point of view, one has to question uh, their efficacy, especially when you realize he's behind the business selling the supplements. But even if not everything he says is credible or you're skeptical about some of the things he says for good reason, uh, there's, I think, enough evidence to make humanists uh, need to uh, perk up and pay attention to uh, these sorts of claims. We can't explore radical life extension as a secular approach to death and dying without talking about this chap, Aubrey de Grey. He's only in his 40s, but he already looks like a wizened old man. I think uh, uh, you know, he's playing the part. He's chief science officer for the SENS Research Foundation. I've interviewed him a number of times, invited him to conferences, I've put on, he's a colorful character, a sort of rock on tour, a public intellectual and performer type, like a lot of these folks I think ultimately need to be. And his big idea, sort of contra uh, Kurzweil in a sense, is not just to cure diseases um, to let people getting older and older indefinitely, but uh, the application of regenerative medicine. You heard uh, Annalita talk last night about regenerative medicine. The application of that to human life extension. So whereas Kurzweil will talk about uh, uh, computer technologies extending human life, nanobots that enter our bloodstream and clean out uh, arthrosclerosis or something, um, Aubrey de Grey talks about regenerative medicine using, say, stem cell research uh, to restore the tissues and the cells of the human body, if not naturally, at least uh, not mechanically, uh, if, if you understand. So, is this just so much exciting science fiction, or is there something behind it? Well, as a skeptic, as something of a professional skeptic, um, I have to concede that in the uh, biological and the physical sciences, there's a growing consensus that technological changes are in the works that will radically extend our lives. But there is debate. The debate uh, widely, though, is just about um, 
exactly when this will happen. Will it happen in 25 years or 150 years? And just how dramatic will the life extension be? Will we live to be 150 or will we live to be thousands of years old? And there have been sort of straight-faced arguments that the technology uh, will be here soon enough for some of us in this room to live thousands of years. This is Kurzweil's notion of living long enough, just long enough to live forever. It sounds overblown, but here's the rationale. That the rate of technological change will so accelerate that every single year you're alive, medical technology has improved to keep you alive a little bit longer than that one year. So it's sort of an exponential argument that once you pass a point, as long as you're alive then, you know, uh, the medical scientists will uh, take care of you. Now there are objections, uh, not from a skepticism side, um, such a project is against God. It's it maybe against the natural order. Maybe instead of uh, buying into this notion that, oh, you shouldn't uh, play the mad scientist, it's against God, what are you doing? Uh, we should uh, think about the moral arguments for this. Um, maybe if a religious person has an objection because radical life extension is against God, the argument should be, uh, maybe you have a religious duty instead to ameliorate suffering, to, um, to work to reduce the 150,000 people who die every day, most of whom who die very miserably, um, and uh, at, at, uh, when they're very old and suffering. So if you're a religious person, and, and you're talking about a moral duty not to muck with God's natural order, um, uh, maybe uh, you can concede that you have a moral duty to reduce that human suffering. Consider uh, that growing old, um, that, when, that when you're very old and you're trying to live uh, longer, according to current uh, medical technologies, you'll spend more in the last one year of your life than in the previous whole of your life. Um, and a lot of that is just horrible suffering. So uh, radical life extension is a way to um, ameliorate that suffering. One argument is that, you know, don't muck with evolution. We were sort of evolved to live a certain amount of time and you just don't know the, uh, it's sort of the law of un unintended consequences. You just don't know the, the genie you'll unleash if you, uh, uh, you know, muck around with nature like this. And uh, this, this sort of criticism or uh, objection to radical life extension claims uh, generally is of the variety that, hey, we have a time limit, a sort of hardwired, uh, evolved time limit, either genetically or there's uh, a sort of endocrine theory of a biological clock that says our hormones sort of uh, have uh, determined that we can only live a certain amount of time. There's an immune system theory of aging that says as you grow older, your immune system wears out and it's inevitable that uh, because your immune system wears out, you'll be more susceptible to, to, to disease and death. And it's part of the system, it's part of evolution, and you can't undo it. Uh, it should be said that none of these arguments that it's against evolution against the will of evolution, so to speak, none of these arguments are actually consensus. Saying it's against evolution is sort of like saying radical life extension is unnatural. And it is unnatural, but so is culture in a sense, and without sounding flip, so is fighting uh, uh, tuberculosis or communicable diseases or uh, malaria, you know, those are, that's the natural order. And so we're constantly fighting against nature. Indeed, uh, that is the human project. Uh, Paul Kurtz would consider it the humanist project. Uh, and I'll conclude with that point in a moment. One objection 
and this has a, a, a sort of wider buy-in, is that even if this is real, it's not going to be for everybody. It's only going to be for the haves, for the fit though few, the rich people who can afford it. The sort of faith claim among these technologists, these technophiles, including Diamandis, whom Saroja mentioned, is that no worry, uh, future technology will create such an abundance, we'll live in a sort of Star Trek universe where there's no scarcity. Uh, Kurzweil talks about nanotechnology, uh, building anything we want from the ground up. So there won't be limited amount of gold, there won't be limited amount of, you know, like, whatever resource we need. And, um, and there are some economic arguments for and against. It's a little above my pay grade to get into that, but uh, this is one objection that has a wider sway. One is, uh, uh, one objection is that it's uh, just too expensive. Uh, it, it, not too expensive just for poor people, but for society. It's too expensive for society. This is the objection that, fine, it's possible, we see the technological trends, but it's too costly. Our society would be burdened by people living longer and longer already. Uh, you look at Medicare and social services for aging populations, and if they were living so much longer, it'd be a so, uh, much bigger burden on society. Well, the rejoinder to that is the way we die now, and I touched on this a minute ago, is already horribly inefficient. That sounds a little cold, but expensive. It's horribly expensive. I mentioned that people on average spend more on their health care in the last year of their lives than in the entirety of their lives before that last year. And uh, obviously, the average costs of health care for people in their twilight years would dramatically fall if they remained healthier for much longer periods of their lives. So that's an economics argument that is sort of uh, debunked. This is uh, another objection. You might call it the Malthusian objection to radical life extension. Yes, if people actually stopped dying or largely stopped dying, overpopulation, uh, much more than it currently exists, would result. The overall death rate would go down worldwide if these life extension technologies are developed or realized, and that would mean that overall birth rates would have to go down in order to make sense out of that project. And if you're scared about overpopulation, like I've been, the good news is that birth rates are already declining, and they imagine that after it peaks, it will, uh, the population will level out in the mid part of this century. Birth rates are already declining and not only in the West. Right now, according to New York Times piece I read uh, a couple weeks ago, nearly half of all people on the planet live in countries where the women in those countries are not reproducing enough to uh, uh, sort of co cover the population. In other words, they give birth to fewer than 2.1 babies, which is generally the number that uh, uh, population specialists think are required to re uh, replace both parents. And this, again, isn't just true in, in the West, it's true in Mel Melbourne, Moscow, San Paulo, Tehran, Tokyo, uh, Armenia, Bhutan, El Salvador, so it's a, a trending thing around the world. Now, it's also true that in the third world, especially in Catholic countries, uh, people are having a lot of babies, and uh, uh, we can, I don't know if we take heart in this, but in th th there's sort of a, uh, um, like the secularization hypothesis says that as a society gets richer and wealthier and more needs are met, religion declines. Well, also what declines is uh, birth rate. Uh, and, and we've seen that in America. Women currently in the West right now delay the birth, are increasingly delaying the birth of their first child till their mid-30s. And the question is, would they delay it much longer if they were living to 150 years old? Why would you have a baby in your 20s if 
you have another 130 years on the planet. One objection is that, okay, maybe it's true, but it would be horrible. A science fiction dystopia. And in fact, you see uh, uh, scary evidence of this right now in totalitarian states. In China, for instance, slave labor camps, Falun Gong, Falun Dafa, uh, prisoners are killed by the state, this is well documented by the United Nations, for organ transplants. So imagine if the haves want to live longer, uh, just imagine this scary sci-fi future. Well, the answer uh, has to be the sort of faith we as humanists have in the institutions of democracy to protect our civil liberties, and we always have to defend the barricades and fight that good fight. That sounds a little dismissive, but you know that, that is the answer to any of these scary uh, uh, possible dystopians resulting from totalitarianism. One of the most persuasive arguments I've read and followed against radical life extension is just that it is, uh, in, uh, so, uh, according to a sort of consequentialism or utilitarian cal calculus, it is just immoral. Wanting to live longer reduces the overall amount of happiness according to a utilitarian calculus. Now this is a sort of uh, I'm going to be talking about Peter Singer, so it's a sort of a, a rich, robust moral argument, but uh, he makes this point with the thought experiment. He says, let's imagine researchers develop a pill, you take it, you live to be 150. You know, he's sidestepping the actual technological claims for this thought experiment, and he assumes that people living to 150 will have an average happiness level of five out of 10 possible units of happiness. And that's true for the first 75 years. And then normally they'd on average die, 75 or 80. Let's say they live to 150 and maintain the same amount of happiness level. Well, then that means it would reduce their happiness level on average over their life to about four for that period. If you're following me about re reducing it over the longer span, reducing the happiness. My friend, the Australian philosopher Russell Blackford, has a counter-argument, uh, actually also on consequentialist or utilitarian grounds. He says, instead of the pill, imagine a hypothetical god who has the choice between creating a world of one, mil one billion happy people who on average are six out of 10 happy over the course of their 75 years. The total, uh, uh, oh, so he also has a choice alternatively, to create a planet populated with six billion pretty miserable people. Let's say they're, on average, only one and a half units happiness out of a scale of one to 10. Well, if you're just looking at the total units of happiness, which is what Peter Singer did in his uh, thought experiment, there's actually more units of happiness, so to speak, on the planet of six billion people. And Blackford says, so we can see that this line of argumentation is ultimately hollow because we have to care not about the total units of happiness, but about the actual happiness for people who are living. Um, the, the way he says it is, we expect a benevolent God to be concerned about how well live go, lives go rather than about the sheer number of lives there are. What we value is whatever actual lives that come into existence um, we value that they should be the, the lives that go well. Sort of continuous with this uh, argument that uh, radical life extension is immoral is this existential, this sort of atheistic existential argument that death itself is a moral good. Uh, now, you don't hear a lot of humanists preach that gospel. You read the existentialists, you, you, you get a sense of this. You'd never hear Paul Kurtz say, you know, viva death, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, th this is the argument that says there are some uh, measurable virtues to mortality. And Dr. Ralph Lewis sort of touched on this in his remarks when he talked about existential meaning we can derive from knowing that we're going to, to die. You know, just to uh, uh, 
speed up on this one point. There is an argument, and maybe Massimo Piliucci, who later today I think is going to be talking about stoicism, there's an argument that says knowing you're going to die is the thing that helps you make every day count. And if you think you're not going to die, and indeed this is an, athe this is an atheistic argument against a lot of religious belief and nonsense belief in heaven, if you think you're going to live forever, you, it's actually life-denying and diminishes uh, the here and now. Uh, the, the response, I think, to that, and that's a, cha that's a challenging challenge, so to speak, is straight from Paul Kurtz. As I mentioned at the beginning, I spent uh, a decade of my life working closely with him. He is someone who repudiated this sort of pro-death argument to derive meaning from life. Uh, he had an almost uh, paranormal love of life in and of itself. Uh, I, I mentioned I did about a hundred hours, I think I mentioned about a hundred hours of oral biography with Paul and over the course of that and my decade working with him, he was just in love with life. He had a zest for living. Um, he called it exuberance. Um, one of my favorite quotes of his as I begin to finish up is from Transcendental Temptation. He says, Promethean men and women refuse to bend to nature except at the moment of death. They seek to transform nature to suit their purposes. So my argument as a humanist introducing us a bit to transhumanism is why let death be the exception. Death is also something natural that we can rebel against and fight against. Indeed, if life is a moral good, then I would argue that living indefinitely long isn't the point but that we need as humanists to engage with the growing transhumanist community to argue, that, uh, to argue for a radical extension of what Paul called the good life. As Paul said many times, the good life is defined by human-centered plans and projects that, bring, that we bring to fruition in the world, those plans and projects that make the world a better place, that ameliorate human suffering. Paul... Uh, has this line in the 73 Manifesto, no God will save us, we must save ourselves. So if the, prim if the primary humanist value is the conviction that we can succeed at some grand plan in the human interest, uh, I think as a humanist movement, we should increasingly consider uh, the, the project of fighting death one of those grand projects and plans. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. I learned a lot from DJ from 11.30 to 12.10 now. A lot of technology and uh, various uh, perspectives on life and death. And um, thanks to all the vaccines, good food, exercise, we are extending our life. Uh, we are proud of that and we really work hard for that. The population in India increased so much I can give all the kudos to the medical profession. And um, I, to my knowledge, half the village will be wiped out by cholera during cholera season, and smallpox takes the same toll. So it is wiped out, uh, almost 100% wiped out in India, the smallpox, cholera every now and then. But uh, that's, we have to be blamed. I mean, doctors have to be blamed for the population explosion in India. <laughs> but a lot of my relatives are still living. My mother lived up to 83 years old, my father the same age, so thanks to the medical miracle. And uh, we saw, I think a lot of people saw the movie Green Mile, where Tom Hanks living forever by a magical touch. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, understandable, but we want to live in fantasy. But um, Taking hundreds of supplements is unimaginable for me. Uh, I gave uh, Sam about seven pills, and he say, complains to all of our friends. She is giving, him, giving me one centimeter long stones every day to <laughs> swallow. <laughs> well, we are addicted to supplements. Yes, I, me too. So the take-home message for 
from their lectures at, up until now is count each day as a gift and uh, live here and now. Now DJ will take the questions. Thank you. So a couple questions were handed, but maybe to save time, if anyone has any questions, you could also raise your hand. Um, one, one note, and I love this, uh, this example, uh, is this from Beth? About, so Beth wrote um, that Corliss Lamont in 1979 expected that he would die of a calcified aorta, something that ran in his family. Instead, he survived with what he considered a medical miracle. A pig's aorta was installed. He'd, he would drink a toast to medical science and the pig. So to medical science and the pig, yes. Uh, the point is we're right now living through not what they consider the evolution of technology, but what historians of science are calling revolutions, a, a, a sort of a new um, industrial revolution. Uh, it, the the uh, impact of changes society-wide are comparable to what happened during the industrial revolution. Uh, are there any uh, questions? I do have one here. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, yeah. Um, as a professional skeptic, I wonder how you grapple with this more specifically in that um, you know, I, I know that our movement has a soft spot for science fiction, and then sometimes we don't look at it as critically as we right. should. And so, um, you know, how, what's your take on this? How much of this is really legit? So, I would... I would like to answer by analogy. He asked, as a skeptic, how much of this is legit? So uh, I'll be scolded by a rhetorician by our, uh, answering by analogy. But I listen almost every day, with no apologies, to Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, uh, amazing goofball who, who imagines global, uh, he calls globalists, he calls them globalists who are in charge, pulling the levers of society. You know, so he, he has some outlandish claims. Um, but I listen to him a lot because I'm writing on conspiracy theory and interested in the topic. And after sort of fact checking and really digging in, it turns out that you know, on some three hour episodes of his broadcast where he draws some outlandish and bizarre and completely incredible conclusions, upward of 60, 70, some episodes, 80% of the, th the actual fact claims he says are accurate. His problem is not in saying false claims, but connecting dots that aren't there. Uh, his analysis and conclusions are wackaloo and very entertaining. Um, uh, leaving aside the fact that I heard him have, I think, the only nervous breakdown that's ever been broadcast uh, on the air one Christmas when he was talking about uh, the UN and a conspiracy to kill babies around the world, and he wasn't talking abortion, he was talking like satanic ritual sacrifice, whatever. And he was very serious and heartbroken. Leaving aside stuff like that, um, a lot of what he says, just in terms of fact claims, are credible. The same, I think, is uh, true for uh, a lot of the fact claims in radical life extension, transhumanism in general. Uh, they're evidence-based. You can just, someone says, uh, technology changed from this point to that point over this duration of time by this much. You can look at it. You could test it. You, oh, well, that's true. The, the, where it gets fuzzier is the conclusions people draw from the facts. And so I would, uh, by way of example, I would uh, probably find... Uh, Aubrey de Grey a little more credible. He's in, in, indeed expressed skepticism of some of Kurzweil's strong claims, even though he's the leader in the field about life extension. He repudiates the term of immortality, this sexy sort of overselling to a gullible pu public of these claims. He says, look, I don't want to make people live forever uh, or be immortal. Immortality is something religions do. I want to make people be healthy for hundreds of years using science. 
Um, following on your question, someone asked, uh, can we hear a little about uh, science, uh, scientific consensus or uh, you know, doubt about Kurzweil's idea on AI-based immortality, something I didn't talk about regarding radical life extension because it's, uh, if continuous, it's uh, beside the point, is, is the claim in Kurzweil and some information scientists, not biomedical scientists, but information scientists that say the real immortality isn't making our bodies last longer, but it's somehow figuring out computers and strong AI so we can upload our consciousness and that's the immortality. I think uh, while there's some interesting work being done there in Silicon Valley and at Stanford uh, and with him at Google with strong AI, that is much more tending towards sci-fi than applying rejuvenation medicine to growing a new liver with stem cells uh, because your old one wore out. You know, that's basically the theory of aging in radical life extension, that we're not hardwired by any certain age, it's just a brute fact of bodies wearing out. You buy a car, you drive it for 30 years, you know, the, the, the pieces will wear out, the pieces of the body will wear out too, and the solution is to replace the pieces of the body like you replace uh, the pieces of the car. Um, Obviously, people argue with that, but I think that's a lot more credible than the strong AI and uploading consciousness and that sort of stuff. Ralph. You notice the coincidence that Ray Kurzweil's forecast of the singularity uh, seems to coincide with his natural uh, lifespan in yeah. the absence of the uh, singularity. Are you detecting just a hint of egocentrical bias here, and is there a little bit of narcissism <coughs> behind the uh, uh, I'm charmed by him. Uh, but, but yes, the, the, Diderot has this great line, heaven for the atheist is posterity. We don't live for heaven, we live for the future. Kurzweil lives for his future, and he's very open about it. He tearfully will recount in transparent moments that his whole raison d'etre for this project is that he misses his dad, and he wants to create... Uh, a way of strong AI to figure out how to bring his dad back to life. Now, more power to him. I, I, you know, I criticize that like I criticize folks talking about reincarnation or going to heaven. Um, but uh, even bad motivations can sometimes result in good things, or nonsense motivations, I mean, can result in good things. And the, the man has accomplished a great deal. And I think, therefore, he's worth our attention even as he's worth a, a bit of our skepticism. So, so thank you very much. It was my pleasure to uh, explore this topic with you, and we can talk at a break as well. Thank you. <laughs>